Good morning, church. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Let's stand to our feet if you're willing and able. We're going to lift our voices and sing to the King of Kings. He's worthy of our worship. Come on, sing with us. I believe in the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. I believe that the power of the gospel so makes the broken whole. I believe that the curse of sin was broken. When they roll away that stone, I believe, I believe, I believe. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I live in. And no matter where I go, and no matter where I our fall when we fall down on our knees i believe that the lane will go walking and the blind are gonna see i believe that the gates of hell will tremble when the church begins to sing i believe i believe i believe as i bow before you To every generation Look at what the Lord has done Sing it to the darkness That the light has come Oh, sing it to the nation Look at what the Lord has done Sing it to the daughters Oh, sing it to the sun to every generation look at what the Lord has done see it to the darkness that the light has come oh see it to the nations look at what the Lord has done look at what the Lord has done has I bow before you Lord I will rise in confidence I will see your goodness Lord in the land I'm living in and no matter where I go no matter where I be I will see your goodness Lord in the land I'm living in as I bow before you Lord I will that our God is alive, that he's for us, that he's with us, that he's faithful, that he is the king of the whole universe, the resurrected king of kings and Lord of lords. And so this song reminds us, and we need to sing it to our souls, friends, because we forget, but he is on the throne. So sing it with us. Here we go. God is on the throne. He reigns forevermore. Just think about it. Just think about it. So why should I worry? Why should I fear? Why should I run when Jesus is here? I'm safe in his arms. I'm safe in his heart. And nothing can take me away from his love. Why should I worry? Why should I fear? Why should I run when Jesus is here? I'm safe in his
defender. He is for us, church. He's for you this morning. He wants you to have life and have it to the full. So any lies that the enemy tells you that, oh, he just wants to take away your fun. Oh, he just wants to keep you from doing what you really want to do, being who you really want to be. No, he made you. He loves you. He wants you to have life in him. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you are a good father. Thank you, God. Would you realign our hearts? We forget, so I forget so quickly who you are and what you've done and how you are with me and how you are for me. Would you remind every soul in this room, every soul watching online of what is true right now, that you made them, that you love them, that you have a plan for them, a good purpose for them that you are trustworthy, God, that every word you say is trustworthy and true. Thank you, Jesus. Church, would y'all pray with me? Let's pray for another local church. We try to do this each week. Today we're praying for Valley Rise Church. Their pastors, Christian and Alex. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, this couple leading this congregation. We pray, pray your blessing on them. We pray that you would go before them, that you'd lead them in every way that you'd fill them with your spirit, that you'd empower them to be love and light in this community. And we're also praying for one of our ministry partners, the Coleman family. They are missionaries to a refugee population in Greece. Thank you for the work they're doing, God. Would you bless them? Would you provide for them? Would you protect them? Make yourself known to them. Be their sustenance. Draw them close. God, we love you, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace. We're going to keep singing, church. This song reminds us of his mercy. I feel that. There's nothing good in us. It's just God having mercy. When he was rich 
in mercy, rich in love, he saved us when we didn't even care. When we were enemies, he saved us. Sing this. I was hopeless. I knew I was lost. And death and darkness were my only songs. I needed someone to come rescue me. Then mercy heard my plea. And Lord, you found me. You healed me. You called me from the grave. You gave me your real love. Thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Oh, now I'm living like I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. Because that's what your mercy did for me. You gave me beauty for my guilty stain. the resurrection of Jesus, this merciful Jesus we sing about, and him coming and dying for us. And then he says, I can't stay long, but I'm going to leave my Holy Spirit with you. And he's going to give you wisdom, and he's going to give you peace, and he's going to be in all parts with you. So we sing about that today. Sing this out with me. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I look to you, God, I look to you, and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
hallelujah, he reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns. You sound amazing. Sing louder. Hallelujah. again. beautiful time of worshiping the one and only King Jesus. Thank you guys for worshiping with us. You may have a seat. Hey there and welcome to Faith Bridge. I'm Tyler Riley. And I'm Hannah Connor. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we are so glad you're worshiping here today. If you're new here, stop by the Connection Center in the atrium after the service so we could say hello and give you a gift to thank you for joining us today. Also, make sure to check out the bulletin. It's a great way to get to know us a little better. If you didn't get one when you came in or you're watching online, you can visit faithbridge.org Sunday to find our digital bulletin. And while you're there, you can fill out your Connect card. That's the little card that's attached to the bottom of your bulletin, and it lets us know that you are here worshiping with us today. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out. You could drop that in the basket when it comes by in just a moment. While you're working on that, we want to tell you about a few things happening at FaithBridge. The first is a class that starts next week, April 14th. It's called Exploring Jesus and Christianity. And if you're new, newer, or returning to the faith, this class would be a great next step for you. It's a safe space for you to ask questions and learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. The Christian life is one lived in community. So jump into this class and meet others who probably have the same questions you have and don't journey alone. You can learn more and register at faithbridge.org explore. Now let's tell you about our favorite week of the year, which will be here before you know it, Vacation Bible School. We are so excited to announce that Spark VBS will be running June 10th to 13th this year. That's right, at Spark VBS, your kids will embark on thrilling quests and engage in unforgettable activities, igniting their faith and bringing them closer to Jesus. That's right, and there are still spots available for our evening sessions. Register today at faithbridge.org slash VBS. And here's another opportunity that you can do as a family. Serve Saturday is coming up on April 20th. Serve Saturday is a great opportunity to serve outside the walls of the church. It's a day when faith bridgers roll up their sleeves and meet the needs of the community by partnering with local nonprofits. You can check out the serve opportunities at faithbridge.org slash Saturday. Hey, we're coming off an incredible, amazing Easter weekend at Faith Bridge. On Thursday, we celebrated Maundy Thursday with over 600 Faith Bridgers on campus. It was just the right way to prepare our hearts for Easter. Over the course of four services on Saturday and Sunday, we saw God move and answer prayers in a big way. We had 6,780 people worshiping on campus and 1,000 joining us online. We had 116 people respond to Pastor Ken's call to be baptized. And 119 people express interest in the Exploring Jesus and Christianity class. So you may want to register for that pretty soon if you're thinking about it. And the best news of all, 115 people accepted Jesus and were made alive in Christ. That is a big reason to celebrate. Their journey is already being covered in prayer because hundreds of faith bridgers committed to praying for each person who took a next step at our Easter services. All weekend, we celebrated our risen Savior, His triumph over death, and the new life that we can find in Him. We made new memories, we worshiped loud, and God showed up big. We're going to move into our giving back to God time now. That's what we call our tithes and offerings moment. If you're a guest with us, please don't feel like you have to give, although you're welcome to if you'd like. We are just really glad you're here today. This moment is for our members and regular attenders. It's our chance to respond to God's love with faithful generosity, giving back to Him out of the abundance He has given us. 
As the ushers come forward to lead us, we're gonna continue to worship through giving, and around here we like to do that the way the Bible says, which is cheerfully. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy uh, first Sunday after Easter. Really glad that you are here today, especially if you're uh, just dropping in or, or visiting. So I've been excited about our preacher of the day, and I'm going to introduce her, although I said this is your third time. So I think this will be the last time I'm introducing you because next time you're just walking up and you're just family. And uh, But Beth Moore is uh, such a gifted preacher, teacher, writer, Bible study leader, influencer of uh, thousands, or probably millions by this point. Um, and I know that uh, many, perhaps most of you know that, and so I don't want to take any of her time away. Why don't you put your hands together and let's welcome Beth back to Faith Bridge. so much, Pastor Ken. Oh, I am so glad to be here. And I love when I was watching on that little video clip that you call yourselves faith bridgers. I, I want to be an honorary faith bridger is what I want, Ken. Um, I loved pulling into the parking lot this morning because I, this time I felt at home. I didn't feel like I felt better last time and like, yeah, yeah, I see some familiar faces. This time it was like, I know where to park. And you know, once you know where to park, Everything changes at church. It, it does. It's just like I need to know where to put my car and that when I leave, I can find my car. I am so happy to have my man of 45 and a half years with me this morning. That's my husband, Keith, over there on the other side of Ken. His grandmother went to the grave believing that Keith and I met at church, which we did not. We met at a fraternity party in college. But somehow when Keith told her that I was a church girl, she got in her head that, of course, we had met at church. Once we figured out that that's what she thought, she told all the rest of the grandsons, why don't you find a girl at church like your cousin Keith did? And it was just like, it was like, let's just lie to her to the death. There's no going back on this now. So that's how, that's how she went to the grave. I have to tell you today as I get to serve you that I am teaching out of a brand new Bible. And what I do mean is it came in the mail to me. I ordered it and it came into the mail to me just yesterday. So I've even written on the top of the portion that I'm about to read to you. First segment of scripture I taught with this Bible 4, 7, 24. I mean, I just got ready to mark in it and thought this is this is means something to me because to me as a teacher, now I don't know how this is gonna land with you, but for me, once I've really marked up a copy of scripture and once I know how to anticipate where I'm gonna find it, then I'm like, oh, you're done. That that Bible's gonna get retired and given away because I'm gonna start all over again, read all the way through it over the course of the next couple of years, and then when I get too familiar with it, I'm gonna do the same thing. About every 10 years, I even change formal translations so that it will not be something that I think has become my security blanket, but instead it is the holy word of God, our authority for all things life and godliness. So I, I gotta tell you what I lack in communication skills, I make up for in just, I love the text. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I just love it. And I pray that today, 
somebody is going to have that birthed in them. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to show this to you right here because you're thinking to yourself, now that is a giant Bible. But I want you to know that no, it is not just a giant Bible. It says right here on this page, it is a super giant Bible. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't even need to have the screens to be able to read from my Bible this morning. But there's something that is precious about having studied long enough to where you got to have a super giant print Bible. And I want to say to somebody that God's going to raise up as a teacher in her or his 20s that I hope you think about it decades later that when you could read all the tiny text, but you kept getting the next lenses and the next lenses and the next lenses. Because I knew 40 years ago when I first had a Bible teacher that loved that scripture more than he loved his next meal. I knew that I was ruined for anything else but to study this text. And I, I have loved it so much. And I pray that in some way I can even testify through the scriptures today how it made such a transforming difference in my life. So would you pray with me and let's get started. Lord, I'm asking you for big things today. And I'm not just asking you for one. I'm asking you, Lord, that for every ear upon whom these words fall, that it will be received, Father, down deep, and that somebody, Lord, somebody, somebody will find a reason to come back to life and to do what you have called them to do. I love you, Lord. You have saved my life. You have saved my mind. And I praise you. Now bring these words to life, Holy Spirit, who breathe them on the page. Breathe them in a fresh breath over us this morning. In the glorious and holy name of God, everybody say amen. amen. I'll start reading at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Now we have this treasure in clay jars so that this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body, so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then, death is at work in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you, indeed everything, is for your benefit, so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. And then in, at least in the CSV, I'm going to read the next six words and pray that they stick with us today. Therefore, we do not give up. I want to say those words to you one more time. Therefore, we do not give up. I wonder if you'd repeat those with me. Therefore, we will not give up give up. Therefore, what is it therefore that tells us why we will not give up? Listen, it is no small thing to be able to profess what you are and what you are not. In times of great challenge, it's a wonderful thing to say, well, I may be this, but I'm not this. Say, for instance, you've been in a car accident, and, and you realize as the car comes to a stop, okay, okay, I, I, I've, I've had a wreck, I'm not sure my arm is not broken, but I'm not dead. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And part of that proclamation is saying, this is what I know to be true. Oh, oh I'm, I'm in it all right, I'm in it. But I have not been taken out. And I want you to see with me in these phrases, when he's doubling up these words, when it comes to the part that says, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed, in verse 8, perplexed, not in despair, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down and not destroyed. If we could see it in the Greek language, we would see that there is assonance, there is a, a rhythm that he's speaking from. And almost every single one of the pairings, the second word is a magnification of the first. Let me see if I can do it just in, in plain words. I, I'm pressed down, but I am not utterly crushed. 
I'm at a bit of a loss, but I'm not utterly lost. I may be hunted down, and that's what it means to be persecuted, to hunt down. In fact, I, I didn't take the time to say this in the previous service, but I love it so much. In Philippians chapter 3, when Paul talks about his pursuit of Christ, he's using the word that we would use for persecuting. He's, use, he's saying, I have been hunted down. I hunted down people of the way, and now for the rest of my life, I will hunt down Christ. It's a gorgeous play on words. I'm hunted down, but I'm not abandoned. I'm not by myself. And then it goes on to say in that last little pairing, struck down, but not destroyed. I'm knocked down, but I'm not knocked out. And, and I'm praying with all of my heart today that, that this is not just a, a usual Sunday thing that we just like, this is what we do, and then we get back in the car and we drop home and, and nothing's really changed. I'm praying today that somebody here who feels like you have been knocked out will realize that that is a lie. You may have been knocked down, but you are not out. If you are in Christ, I have good news for you. You can't get out if you try. He has got you solidly in the palm of his hand. We'll go through things and think, I I'm destroyed. This has destroyed me. And it it it's a feeling that very much uh, witnesses to us as real and true. But the biblical facts are no, nothing can destroy us once we are in Christ. All it can do is make us think and make us act as those who are convinced we are destroyed. Now look back at 10 and 11, and I want you to see the concept that we're working with today. It says, we always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. Watch it again. He's going to say it a little different way. Verse 11. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life may be displayed in our mortal flesh. Okay, now what is he talking about? He is talking about these frequent times we'll have in our lives that he is referencing as what we might think of deaths and resurrections in miniature. He says things, you know, we're just constantly dying. And, and you know what he's talking about because you have things that just like kick you all the way down. We go through different seasons of life that we think are going to absolutely kill us. I talked to someone right after the service in the previous service, and she said to me, I just said to the Lord yesterday, I'm dead and done. It is over for me. And so we'll get into that situation, so much heartbreak, whatever it may be, and we'll think there is no rising up from this, and this is what I want you to see. That any time we go through these things that Paul is referencing, he's calling these cycles of suffering when it feels like something is dying, that they're always followed up by some kind of rising, some kind of resurrection. And I'm wondering if I can talk anybody this morning into believing that to be so about yourself. In uh, the commentary on 2 Corinthians, a scholar, S.J. Haifman, writes it this way, and I'm quoting him. Paul's suffering is again portrayed under the image of death. Paul views his suffering to be a divinely orchestrated death that, like the cross of Christ, performs a revelatory function. A revelatory function. Okay, listen carefully to this. The key word here is display. Because what Jesus is saying is that every single time we go through something that feels like it's brought a death of some kind, uh, somebody may be here today that you've, you've had the death of a really dear relationship, the death of an engagement perhaps, the death of a marriage, uh, the death of what you feel like, that, that was my career, that, that was my whole vocation, I, I don't even know what to do with myself now. You might feel like it's, it's the death of everything. I don't even know. I don't even recognize my own life right now. Anybody been? I have been there where I've looked around me and go, I, I don't, where is, what did someone do with my life? I don't know where it went. And he's saying that in these dyings in miniature, in these, uh, in these uh, transitory sufferings that he's comparing to dyings, that there's always a rising. Because that's God. He's a resurrection God. He cannot leave death alone. It's for him to be displayed, his extraordinary power to be displayed in us. Resurrection power to be displayed. 
in us. I want you to think about because he says that what was death to us was life for you. So this can happen in any one of our lives. Something like this may have happened to you. Where you went through something really tough, but somebody around you got to watch you go through it and come to the other side and rise up from those ashes. And because of that, their lives were somehow changed by that witness. This would have happened to the Galatians in uh, Paul's ministry. It says in Galatians chapter 4, he tells them, he says, You know that it was because of a bodily ailment that I came and preached the gospel to you in the first place. In other words, you weren't on my itinerary. I got sick and I needed help and we stopped off at Galatia. But what happened? In that dying of sorts, that metaphorical dying of sorts, what happened is the Galatians had the gospel preached to them, and they came to life. I want you to see this pattern and start to see it in your own life. This Sunday after Easter, I want us to think about what it means to be a people of a crucified and resurrected Lord. We are a people given to resurrection. When our lives finally are over and we drop these bodies, we will be resurrected. So there's the, these daily dyings, these seasonal dyings, but there will always be a rising. Can you have faith to believe that with me today? I love that portion, and many of you may as well, in uh, Genesis, where Jacob is wrestling with the angel, and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I wonder if we could have that kind of faith and that kind of tenacity that says when we feel like something, we're going through a season that is just flat out killing us or something's just dying, our passion for life, our creativity. Maybe you're a writer and you feel like, I mean, it's, it's over. It's just all blocked. I, I, can't, I can't come up with three words uh, that, that go together. All of the things that we feel like are dying. Can we see and can we believe him enough to be able to say to him, I will not let go until you raise me. I will not. I will not. Can you believe that it is not over for you and that in Christ all death leads to life. It leads to life. So what do we do until we are raised up again? And I'm talking about if we're going through a season right now where we feel like something has died, a marriage has died, a, 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 a something precious to us relationally. has. Died. What do we do until we see some kind of resurrection? And I'm not saying that he's always going to resurrect the thing that we feel like died. But here's what I am going to do. If you belong to Jesus, he's going to resurrect you. You will have a rising. You, will, you think, you know what, life for all practical purposes now is done. There's nothing, I mean, I'm just biding my time now. In fact, I'm here at church because my family comes, I've come with them. But I got nothing. I got nothing now. I got nothing. It's over. As God's going, I got a resurrection for you. Because I am a God who cannot leave death alone. So what do we do? I want you to notice something in these passages. Um, uh, the first point I was making is that in these transitory deaths and resurrections, Jesus is often vividly displayed. That's not the only way he's displayed. If we looked at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, we would be told that each one of us has been given, and you can look it up for the word, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit by way of our spiritual gifts. In other words, when I operate in my spiritual gifts, when you operate in your spiritual gifts, we are putting the Holy Spirit on display because we're doing something that would be beyond our just normal skill and ability. Uh, the same is true of uh, Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, I mean, to love those who love you, what is that? But to love your enemies, then is when you show that you are children of your heavenly Father. Those are ways we make him conspicuous. But nothing makes him more conspicuous than when we should have really been down for the count. We are out. We are out. It is over. And he raises us back to life. I don't know about you, but I think back about the times that that's happened in my own life, and I think everything seemed different. When you realize that, wait, maybe I'm not dead after all. Maybe it's not just existing after all. Maybe there's life after all. It even seems like everything colorful around you is extra colorful around you. Your appreciation for just normal things, suddenly it's like that food actually tastes good after months of depression. Does anybody hear what I'm saying to you? 
What do we do in the meantime? I want you to look at these passages, and my second point would be this. The word we is key in the call of the resurrected. The word we, the word we, we need we in the worst way. I want you to look, and this is something that I did uh, with my passages. I printed it out, that whole portion in 2 Corinthians 4 from 7 through the first six words of 16. I printed it out, then I highlighted every single time the passage says we, or it says us, or it says our. And I literally found that there were 11 occasions of we, there were four occasions of us and three occasions of our. So we sang it constantly, we, 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 we. You and I, if we're going to make it out of these seasonal dyings, the, when we just go through something, it, it may be that you haven't gone through this in 10 years, but life does cycle around in these things that you think something precious to you has died. How do we make it? One way is that we stay connected to we. We got to have we. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to suggest that the devil is the one who came up with the internet. We know that was Al Gore. That was not the devil. <laughs> but what I would suggest to you is that what it has done, and you know it, this is old news, but we still keep doing it. There's just nothing like saying over and over again, this is, this is the harm it's done, but we stay in the harm. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not likely to get off of social media today either, but I tell you the lie it can no longer make me believe, and that's that it's going to replace my real-life compadres in the faith. Do you have a small group of people that at a moment's notice you could call and say, man, I, I, I got to tell you what I'm going through. I need y'all to believe God with me over this situation. I, I really am having a crisis, whatever it may be. We, we need one another. Do you know that Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says that we are to stir up one another to love and good works? And it says something very important. All the more as we see the day is drawing near. In most of your translations, the word day is capitalized because it's the day of the Lord. So what it's saying is this, that we will not need each other less and less and less as time goes on and we get closer to the day of the Lord. We will need each other more and more and more. So this is what I will suggest that the enemy is doing. How much can we be divided where we cannot unite as a we so that we can build one another up in love and good works and stay there in the things of the faith? We need the church community. We need our small groups. And I'm so glad to tell you, I, I'm not on a staff at any church. I, the only time I've ever been on a staff at church was when I taught aerobics 30 years ago. Does anybody know I'm? So I don't, I don't have any stake in this. I'm telling you, in the New Testament, there was no concept of the New Testament church without the fellowship of the saints. It's part of how we make it. Notice with me those six words in verse 16, therefore, we do not give up. I'd like to suggest to you that there have been many times I wanted to give up. Anybody else in the room? Just any time that I wanted to give up. But you know what I have? I have a we. And so when I'm with them, I can come back to them with, I, I don't know, even know how I'm going to make it through. I don't even care if I make it through. But there's my we going, oh, therefore, we do not lose heart. I might lose heart, but I get back around my people in the faith, and suddenly I'm back encouraged once again, and it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Therefore, we do not give up. We do not. I want to show you something that I just think is, is, is wonderful and wild. These are the kinds of things that just uh, compel me to the scriptures over and over. Leave something here in 2 Corinthians 4, but go with me to 2 Corinthians 1. 1. Now, Paul is not thinking that people that are hearing this letter are going to hear it in little bits and pieces. These letters are being read to the congregation and no telling how many times. So he sends the letters, and so they are hearing it most likely from beginning to end uh, the, the letter. No matter how many times it's read, they are hearing it in its context. We study it differently, especially in a message like this. So he would be thinking they are hearing 2 Corinthians 4 after they have heard 2 Corinthians 1. Listen to what he says in 1, verse 8, 2 Corinthians 1, 8. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. Do you know what? A lot of times leaders do want you to be uninformed. I don't think you have one of those. 
But there are leaders all over the place that, that people that are sitting out there in their classes are thinking, you never go through anything. And he's saying, no, I, I want you to make sure you know. We have been to the bottom of this. He says, we were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a terrible death. Okay, so whatever they were thinking was going to happen, they did not just think they were going to die. They were going to die a terrible death. I mean, it's one thing to think, I'm, I'm not going to live through this. Literally, physically, I'm not going to live through this. It's another thing to think, oh, no, no, this is going to be a terrible way to go out. It says, he has delivered us from such a terrible death and will deliver us. We put our hope in him that he will deliver us again while you joining and helping us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. Okay, go with me here. Because do you remember what he said back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Listen to these words. We were afflicted in every way but not crushed. He's just saying that at this point, when they were in Asia, they were afflicted and they were so under the burden of it, they thought they weren't going to live. It says, perplexed but not in despair. What did he just say? Even we despaired to the point of thinking our lives were over. I, I love that. Because can you see that he's working something through? Can you see that he's saying, listen, I need you to know, I have known despair. I have known what it's like to think it is over. And I'm going to tell you that over and over and over again, Jesus just keeps raising us up. He just keeps raising us up, and he just keeps raising us up because he's not finished with us yet. And so it gave him the courage that when he hit the next challenge, he was able to say, you know what? We may have been struck down, but we are not destroyed. Uh, we, we may feel very perplexed. I don't know what's going on here, but I can tell you this. I'm not going to despair because I've watched Jesus do this over and over. This feels like it's going to kill us, but actually it's not. Because even in the final dying, I'm still going to be raised. I want you to notice with me that it says back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, oh goodness, if, if you've known anything about my testimony, which I, I would assume most of you do, do not, but... These words have such power in my life and have been used for such transformation, such renewing of my mind that I, I have to do a, a word of personal testimony here. In, first, in verse 13, 2 Corinthians 4, since we have that same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Okay, do you remember earlier when we sang the worship song, I believe, I believe, I believe. What These, these are creedal things. These are things that we say when, when, when life is just like, has us tumbling when everything feels against us to be able to say aloud with our mouths, this is what I believe. It's one reason we come into the community of faith so that with one another, as different as you are in all this diversity, you are saying together, this is what we believe. We believe Jesus Christ is Lord of all and Savior to all who put their trust in him. Things we believe. So it says that same spirit of faith, we know that to be the Holy Spirit. But that word also means breath. And I love to think of this as uh, CPR. That when I take in a breath of the Holy Spirit, and then when I exhale the Holy Spirit, and then I, or inhale the Holy Spirit, then exhale the truth of God's word, that it is like coming back to life again. When I'm, I'm overwhelmed, always, always, God is going to take me back to the same practice. When I'm about to falter in my faith, when I'm overcome with doubt, what am I going to do? Same thing every time. I'm going to usually stand on my feet, but I'm always going to say it out loud. This is what I believe. This is what I know to be true. Remember in Romans chapter 10 when it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? Sometimes the person that needs to hear it is you. <laughs> Sometimes you need to say it with your own mouth so that your own ears, we think, no, this is for someone. No, no, maybe you need to. And you're thinking, I need somebody to read the word. Pick it up and read it to yourself and do it out loud. I believe, therefore I speak. There's power in that. Saying it out loud. I want you to think about a few examples, and these are ones I've used over and over. I've, I jotted these down off the top of my head. They are something that comes so naturally to me. Lord, according to your scriptures, you are good, and you can do no evil. 
Lord, you are light and in you is no darkness. You are faithful, Lord, and you cannot forsake your own. You're all powerful and nothing is too difficult for you. Lord, greater is your spirit within me than he who is in the world. And Lord, you love me. You have redeemed me. You have saved me. You have forgiven me all my sins and nothing can snatch me out of your hand. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about opening up your mouth. What is it you believe? That when everything, when doubt is coming at you, what do I know to be true? And, and here's what I want to say to you, and then I want to read the last couple of scriptures and, and pray and dismiss. I, I, I want you to understand that in speaking out those words, it so often puts the conviction back in our bones. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like knowing when Jesus has brought you back from the dead that you don't just think he is there and Lord of all. You know that he is. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul said these words, I know the one in whom I believe, and I am convinced that he is able to protect what he has entrusted to me until that day. You know what he's saying? I don't just believe because he has gotten me through so much and because nobody, nobody could have gotten me through but him. You know the gift it's given you? There may be a whole lot of things you doubt, but as to whether or not Jesus Christ is real, seated at the right hand of God, and nothing is too difficult for him, doesn't happen to be one of them. That you are in him, and nothing can steal you from him. I'm going to read to you out of the last part of Romans chapter 8. Hear it in the context of the lesson, because he's going to say something very, very similar. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, listen to this again, because of you, Jesus, we are being put to death all day long. We're counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you know what? When we just plead for a miracle and we don't get it, we think you withheld your miraculous power from me when I needed it. No, 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 he didn't. No, he didn't. He just selected that instead of that miracle, you would be the miracle. You would be the miracle. You're the miracle that the people in your sphere of influence don't know how to deny you become the one he brought back from death to life. Would you pray with me? Lord, you are so faithful. Lord, you are so faithful. Would you just help us, God, to take you at your word and that even when our insides want to doubt with everything in us that we will open up our mouths speak the steadfast promises you have put in scripture and it will put faith back in our bones you are life you are breath you are everything and without you we can do nothing in the glorious and beautiful name of Christ our Lord amen Amen, amen. How about y'all stand up with us? Let's worship together. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea Christ be magnified We're singing
Every creature finds its inmost melody. Every human heart is native of crime. Oh, and in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Yeah, let his praise arise. Bow to idols, let's choose that now. We bow to Him only. And I won't bow to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. You know, as I was listening to the message today, I was I was thinking another thing that was going on while I'm listening to her teaching, and that is just having followed Beth's journey over the last, I don't know, eight years. She's lived this message out, and God has just continued to raise her up, and she has not given up. And and if you don't know her story, you should get to know her story a little bit more. It's, it's so inspiring. I think we should say thank you one more time. What a great word today. So good. And I hope we'll see you next Sunday. Uh, we'll be going back to Genesis. I'm looking forward to that in Genesis 12. If you need prayer, why don't you come up here? And we would love to pray with you. Go in peace. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us today. You can visit faithbridge.org for more information on the ministries of Faithbridge or to ask for prayer. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue making more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ who make more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ. Have a blessed day.